Um, uh, Professor Graham is a Pew Fellow and Professor of Visual Arts at Penn State University. He also serves as an Executive Director of the Photo Alliance in San Francisco. Um, this event is sponsored by both the Photography and Video Department and Black, which is the Black-led Art Coalition student organization at PCAND. As a cultural activist, Professor Graham created the African slash American Garden Project, which is a cultural exchange between urban mothers and Kenyan farmers. His current project, A Conversation with the World, is an ongoing project meant to illustrate our common humanity. And a book prompted by the project has been published by Dats Press. His innovative projects have been cited as the national model for arts education and have been the subject of a Harvard case study. A four-time Pennsylvania Council for the Arts Fellowship recipient, Professor Graham was cited as Artist of the Year and presented the Governor's Award by former Pennsylvania Governor Edward Rendell. He's also received a National Endowment for the Arts Pew Charitable Trust Travel Grant for Travel to Ghana. We are so fortunate to have Professor here. After this talk, he will be uh, meeting with students in Black and having a little virtual lunch. And then on top of that, he is going to uh, grant some time to uh, two of our photography and video students, and uh, they will interview him for our podcast into the dark room. And so it's just very generous, so wonderful for you to be here. Once again, I, I apologize for our technical glitches, but we are rolling now and we're good. So without further ado, uh, you Professor Graham. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing. I did, <laughs> I did one of these for a friend of mine in Carmel at the front, not the Friends of Photography, at the the Center for Photography in Carmel. And we got, we got a, an unexpected visitor. <laughs> oh, who was that? It burned, it, it, was, it, it burned an indelible image onto everyone's mind. I'll have to ask Anne about that. Yeah, oh, you know Anne. Oh yeah, I went to school with Anne. Oh, fantastic. did you know Eric, Eric Roman? No. Okay, because they, yeah, they were all out there together. You knew Wagner Whitehead? Well, he's the he's our big hoodoo at the Penn State these days. We went to school with him also. That's funny. You get around. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot of matriculating. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, Anne is a treasure. Cheers. I would join. I, I would also encourage you to join the Photo Alliance. And anyway, that's another whole subject. So let me try... I guess it's time because that's there's so many introductions and it, you know so much more about me than I know about myself at this point. So let me go ahead and show you. Let's look at some pictures. That'll be fun. Oh, wait a minute. What's this? I wonder if this will work. Oh, the screen has gone black. <laughs> oh, look, there's that thing I read. And then there's my name. Oh, there's the Ted thing. People seem to like that for some reason. Look, there he is. Okay. Oh, 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 okay. So yeah, then we get up to the point where, um, oh yeah, you can't see me. Um, that's too bad. We get up to the point where, um, I had talked to, I had talked to this young fellow. I came to the conclusion that because of my conversations with this individual, that art was the some of the most effective art. Some of some art in its most traditional form had had been going on since people existed, basically. So that whenever I would go into these places, you know, here I am in a cave somewhere out in the Veld in South Africa, right? In the middle of, it was really in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, and there's people, you know, making marks on the wall, they're doing art, they're doing, you know, they're, they're, taking, they're taking place in ritual. There's, you know, little, whether these are, 
are, you know, images that they sort of came up with or whether they're the product of some phenomenon like the camera obscura, we we'll never know. However, you know, what we do have is this kind of expression that plays itself out into modern ritual. You know, these houses were, you know, by the Ndbele were, you know, decorated for a wedding or for, in this case, a birth or the, those were the things that I had been looking for whenever I had traveled. I had made the mistake of looking for traditional forms of artwork with what I thought was traditional forms of artwork, you know, like a guy in a hut with a canvas and a brush. And that, no, it wasn't like that. The work, I mean, that's what I had been educated for. That's what I had been educated to look for. But, you know, what, had, what, what has been, what has been happening for eons are people responding to the needs of their communities, right? People like, uh, you know, we need a house, we need bowls, we need ritualistic objects, we need to address a deity, we need, you know, we need money, we need currency, we need clothes, right? These are all the products of the artists and, and, and all of these needs are met as they are activated in, by the artists in the communities. So once I, once I kind of understood that, I had been invited by the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia to do, to do a piece. I don't know anything about fabric, but nonetheless, they thought that I was worthy. And it's a kind of a residency. And at the time, you know, you could stay for a week or, you know, my project seemed to go on for months. So, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to build, I wanted to build a piece that would acknowledge my, my ancestors. And this was one of those pictures that I took in 1962 that was of, you know, my, my aunt, it's Polaroid. And she basically, you know, along with her husband made sure, and I guess if you look at my Instagram, which is Mr. Lonigram, you can see all those pictures of my ancestors. And they basically made sure that I was able to continue with my commitment, with my interests. So I made a little place because I wanted people to understand what it was like to be in and around, you know, Aunt Dora and Uncle Floyd. And I have to say that, you know, if we had a whole lot more time, I would have showed you a whole lot of, you know, other photographs that I would have brought home and showed Uncle Floyd, you know, photographs of sticks and rocks, and skies, clouds. And so when I'd show those to my folks, you know, I would get the, you know, like, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's nice. Yeah, all right, you know. But then whenever I did this piece, you know, I, cause I, yeah, I did. I went, you know, the workshop came over, they, you know, pulled all this stuff out of my house. They drove it across the Commonwealth to Philadelphia. They stuck it in the museum. Deborah Willis saw it at the fabric workshop and said, well, this is pretty nice. And said, you want, let's put this in the museum and the Smithsonian. I said, great. So then we hauled it all down to Washington DC and I showed uncle Floyd and uncle Floyd said, what's that? And I said, this is my work. Okay, you guys can stop that one. My house. I said, yeah. I said, it's in the museum. He said, so now what I want to do is I'm house up in the museum. I said, I said, yeah. He said, oh, that's all right. <laughs> so now I'm making, I'm making, I am making the connection that I wanted to make, that I needed to make, that I understood now how to make with the community at large, right? So, you know, of course, now I've got to, you know, do another piece for my dad. That was called Living in a Spirit House. This one is, this is my father. So I did, he's, that's near Kennywood, actually. So many, I can talk about this. 
because so you know usually when I do the talk you know nobody knows what Kennywood is so but yeah that's out in Kennywood around 1920 so when daddy was a young fellow so I did this other piece but later when I knew him he you know he had Alzheimer's so I did another piece that would uh it was like a metaphor for his memory the paper embossed with lessons that my father taught me like truth and friendship, humility, those were uh, embossed in that paper that falls apart like his memory. And I did, if you look right in the middle, I'm pointing at the screen like you can see it. There's, if you look right in the middle of the screen, there's this little book that I did. Oh, there's the map. Daddy had in his dining room, daddy had a map so that he could keep track of me. I'd call him up, where are you now, son? That's how I'm in. I'm in Ghana. Where is that? So I had to. So he, we put little pins in the map so he could figure out where I was. So Daddy would travel with me vicariously. But I did this little book about those same things about truth and friendship and humility. And this was in Wenge Wood, and there was you know tapa cloth, and you know things that artists would do. And it was photogravure, and it was all bound. And I had it translated into Swahili and Kikuyu. And I took it back because, you know, they would all complain that these, you know, Mazungu would go and, you know, take all the information and take pictures, but we will never see them. We will never see you again. You come and you make the photos, you go away. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I'll be back. So I did. I went back. I had it translated. I made those beautiful sort of handbound volumes of all of the people that I worked with and saw and met and became friends with and neighbors. And yeah, made that book. This one, so that was, yeah, Lessons at My Father's Table. This one was about, so that was the mind, that was about the mind. And Aunt Dora's piece was about the spirit. And now we've got this piece, which is about the body, because here's me and Uncle Floyd working out in the garden in the autumn after all the crops. And that's in seldom seen. And Mr. Karaoke who I worked with in Kenya. It just makes me sad all these people are gone. But the thing that I, the deal is I had been working alongside Mr. Karaoke. We we're like working on the Shamba. And the, you know, here I'm working with the Kenyans and I'm working with Uncle Floyd. And it sort of occurs to me that, you know, We've all got this in common. I was working on exactly the other side of the world, right? And engaged in an activity that was the same. You know, we're all digging in the dirt. We're all trying to figure out how to get some food. We're all, you know, I thought it was remarkable. And then whenever I encountered these women in, in Homewood, in Pittsburgh, after a certain administration decided that women on welfare were living too large and they decided to cut the food stamp allocation in half. I found these women that were basically digging with tablespoons and, oh, I'm glad that the meeting has been upgraded by the host and now we're having limited minutes. This is so exciting. So it's, they didn't have any food. They didn't have any money. So they took tablespoons, they went to the, the, the CVS, they bought vegetables and they went in their vegetable seeds packets and went into the vacant lots in inner city Pittsburgh and started digging in the dirt with tablespoons, trying to grow food, which was crazy. So I got with the Pennsylvania Conservancy. I got a bunch of dirt delivered out there. I talked to Tom Murphy, who was the mayor at that time. So we got these whole series of gardens set up. I wonder if this will work with that big thing on there. So, no, nope, we're stuck. My thing won't work. I don't have a little cursor anymore. Oh, wait a minute, wait, what's that? We can stop, we can annotate, we can share the screen. Okay, that's the garden, that's the Shamba. So, that's one of the that's one of the sites for the African and American Garden Project. Oh, I can make it go. 
Later, I'll try to go faster because I know we don't have a very long time. Later, I met, you know, these, I was doing a project in Philadelphia. I met some individuals that were sort of hanging around. I'm going to try to make that go away. Hold on. Because I don't have a cursor. I don't know how to make it go away. Can you see that? The thing that says this meeting has been upgraded? We don't see it on our end, so you can go ahead. David Johnson, you're Johansson, you're muted. Can you see it? We, we don't see it on our end. You're all good. Great. Okay, fine. Fantastic. So yeah, this piece is called a home in the homeless. So basically what I did is I photographed all these homeless people. I made sure that they had lunches of some kind and I put all their photographs. This is my room. So I moved my room into the museum and I hung their pictures inside the museum so that the guards couldn't kick them out because they were part of the exhibition. So they could come and hang around in my room and look at my junk and kind of eat their lunch. <laughs> so I just got into all kinds of mischief. So yeah, that was a home and a homeless. This piece was, um, uh, it, was it, it was a piece called Memorialization, Acknowledgement, and it was done in Charleston, South Carolina. I, want, I wanted to acknowledge the efforts of the ancestors by, you can see maybe a little thing over there on the wall. I went to Ghana and I talked to the people who descended from the individuals that built all these plantations in the Carolinas. And uh, I just wanted the, you know, people to kind of acknowledge the fact that we were there. I had to take it down. They didn't like it. So that was for Spoleto. So we had a, a cutting down ceremony where we cut those beautiful red drapes off the wall. And we took all that red velvet and gave it to the quilters. And I walked up the street to the Wilmot Fraser Elementary School and met this guy named Harry Noisette, whose grandfather cultivated the Noisette Rose. And we made a garden in this little elementary school that was about to close because the students had poor test scores. But they had poor test scores, it turns out, because they didn't have a lunch program because that had been cut to save money. So whenever they started growing their own food, their test scores went up. School stayed open because they had all these activities around the garden. Thad Mosley built these little sticks so that whenever we, I went out to the Middleton plantation and looked for all the graveyards for the slaves, they weren't there. I mean, they weren't acknowledged. There was no memorial. So I, I, I made a memorial for them. That's another long story. That's the room that they wanted me to work in. Those are the slave quarters at the Aiken Rett plantation. But I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't stay in there. I just made that little table so that they could go in there and sit down and write what they thought about being in the same room as that the slaves lived in. I built this little farm, me and my friend, John Stone, we built this little farm stand. When people went in there and bought stuff, then we gave that money to the farm workers. That was in the Cincinnati contemporary. A church burned down and we, so I wanted to build a place where people could go and do ritual. And again, you know, there's kids that live on one side of the tracks and kids that live on the other side of the tracks and they're always getting in trouble because they go beat each other up. But the only place that they actually seemed to get together was in this, well, this boys and girls club was built so that they could come in and use it and they didn't. 
so I put these big pictures up on the wall. So they had to come in and if they wanted to see their picture. So then they kind of got together. So we solved the rival gang problem. Oh, this, this piece I did at uh, the African American Museum in Philadelphia. About migration, because you know, black people migrated up from on the flat car railroad cars in 1910. These are their descendants. And in the first image you saw, that's all the junk that they brought with them. I'm going to skip that, I hope. Yeah, because it's a long video. We don't have time. The woman on the right, pictured on the right, is the, the woman who came up on the trains, and the woman on the left was her daughter. Part of that had to do with helping these young people understand how to, you know, we endowed this institution with these cameras so that they could depose all these people that had belonged to the Boys and Girls Club in Wissahickon and start to do these oral histories. Uh, in Morocco, I worked with the Fabric Workshop again, and we got quilters from Brooklyn, and there we go. And Tangier, and we did a one of the, another one of those intergenerational multicultural exchanges. So these are the women that we worked with in Tangier and from Brooklyn. And we had one of those hands across the water kind of things. So it was so much less about, you know, the artwork and so much more about defining our role as artists in the community. In a conversation with the world, I had started it back in, 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 Central, in Central California in the 80s. And basically what it was is I asked a, a series of questions, same questions to people around the world. And, you know, they answer. And the whole trick is that they, I thought it was a failure because everybody answered the questions the same way, but apparently that's the success. It just shows that we're, we have a common humanity. We all basically want the same stuff. And it's all that same stuff that my dad and I would talk about. So San Francisco, they wanted me to do the project there. So I did. And then the Calgary called up. So I went up to work with the indigenous people in Calgary. And we did, you know, these were all, they wanted to have a conversation. Photography here is just the, it's just a vehicle, you know? These people wanted to have a conversation with their community. And it's the same here in Oulu, in Finland. You know, here's these people that, that in many cases had, these are two Finnish women who had in many cases walked or came overland in all the cases, nobody had a plane ticket, from the equator up to Finland, right? Because they come up and they get, you know, they go over through Turkey, they get up through Europe, nobody wants the refugees. And finally they figure out that they can get a home in Finland. But even in Finland, they've got to go up, you know, to Rovaniemi, which is all the way up by the Arctic Circle. So here are these people, so then they find a home in this little community, right? With these folks who, you know, she happened to be very sympathetic. But then they, you know, but then the, the, the Finnish people don't like it and they kill them, they shove them off roofs. So what I did is I went in and I made these photographs of all the different people in these communities. And then I put it in one place and so everybody, if they wanted to see their picture, I did that trick again. They all had to come to the same place. So, you know, the murder rate went down.
because people started talking to each other. This young man, I'm going to go back because I said, I'm talking to him and I'm saying, man, you know, you were living in, you know, paradise. You're living in Africa. How can you manage, you know, this place is so foreign. It's so freezing. And he said, well, he said he, he loved it there in Finland. He loved his new home. And I said, why? He said, I can sleep. I can sleep through the night knowing that I'll wake up in the morning because in Mogadishu, it was always a question. Whenever we went to bed at night, we'd never know if we would wake up in the morning. Something as simple as a good night's sleep is worth traveling half the way around the world a quarter. So then from Finland, from Oulu, I, the conversation with the world took me to, um, where do we go? I mean, I know where I went, but what's on, oh, I'm not going to, not the marching band. But you can sort of see over in the distance where all the pictures are up. This was the opening where they had the ceremony of the fish, the fish spirit and the marching band. And it was, they went all out. But yeah, we went to New Zealand after that. And we worked with this group of indigenous young people who wanted to be seen and heard. They wanted to preserve their, they wanted people to understand what their culture was about. I think that the Maori are interesting because they, they're blending the Eastern or their, their own culture and the Western culture. Again, we did the, you know, we did large billboards, newspaper, magazines. We, I was invited into these ceremonies. I can share them with you because we're not publicizing them. I think this might be close to the end. Yep, there's one of the billboard installations. Oh, well, the thing I'm doing now is uh, the, the Italians built a bunch of dams up in Ethiopia. They, they blocked off the Omo River. So now the Lake Turkana, and the thing that I'm going to take another minute because the thing about Lake Turkana, okay, so in Ethiopia, maybe like 200 miles from where Billy and I are standing here, in Ethiopia is where they found Lucy which is supposed to be like one of the ancestors of humanity, right? 200 miles southwest is where we're standing on the shores of Lake Turkana. So Lucy is maybe 3 million years old. Turkana boy, which is what they found here by Dr. Leakey, he's 2 million years old. If you go another, you know, 200 miles south, then you'll get to the Odavi, the Odavi Gorge, where Dr. Leakey found more early remains about a million years old, right? We're in the cradle of humanity. This is where we ostensibly, we all came from until somebody else finds some more bones down in South Africa someplace. This is where we came from as a species. The Italians and the Ethiopians thought that it was just fine to dam up the river so that now, you know, there's like, the river's dying to the point, uh, the Lake Turkana is just dying to the point where this is, people have to dig down into the dirt to get water. And, you know, all these people have walked like a mile, two miles, five miles and bring in these little yellow containers so that they can buy water for a nickel, a nickel a container. So I was worried about that. So I started to talk to these, you know, these fishermen. I had these big meetings with them. 
you know, I went out, I tried to go out to the, just to, you know, negotiate with some of the other fishermen, but it's not a, you know, that's a tricky proposition. I had to get a security force to go out onto Lake Turkana. It's come to that. It's come to the point where you have to fish for food at gunpoint, all because some foreign government wanted to sell a big multi-billion dollar dam project in governments. So now I'm talking to these people because, you know, we, it's, this is the evolution of obscurity, right? These people descended from millions, of, literally millions of years ago are standing at the precipice of not existing. So that's what I'm doing. I'm out there and I'm talking to them and I'm just making a little eulogy because I can't fix the dam. I can't bring back Lake Turkana. I can't save this tribe of people. You know, I, the only thing I can do is I'm just a, a guy with a camera. That's the elders wanted to meet in that dry riverbed. They know what's going on, but you know, I'm not gonna show this thing either. I think that's the end of it. I'm gonna be done. I don't even know if you can hear it, but I'll stop sharing. Oh, I don't know how to stop sharing. Wait, there's my little thing. I go over here, I go down here. It should be up top, there you go. I tried. Wonderful, Professor Graham. Yes, we are happening. back with non-shared. Uh, the first thing oh. I want to do is- I'm supposed uh, to be stop sharing. It, it stopped. You stopped. Wait, yeah. maybe if I push escape. Everybody, I am sending a, uh, a chat here uh, in the chat to everyone. There is a new Zoom meeting URL for the uh, black meeting after this and also on the calendar anybody who uh, you know is uh, part of the school community if you go to the calendar event that has been updated um, with the the proper new zoom meeting uh, uh, credentials and so it'll all work so much better than how we started out but professor thank you so much will you be uh, open to taking a, a few questions. I like questions better than me just rambling. You guys, if you go down to your reactions button on the bottom and you go and use a hand and, and uh, be, instead of just jumping out and then I will uh, introduce you. So please, somebody give a hand. Great. Huh. Um, we have our first hand. And oh, we do. Yes. And this is Nichelle Morris, who is a junior uh, photography and video major. Nichelle, it's all yours. That was actually me just using the, the clap emoji. I don't quite have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Nichelle. How are you? <laughs> I'm all right. How are you doing? Good. Thank you I'm so just, much. I'm cool. I turned on my new best friend. I've got a little friend who keeps who keeps me company. This is my little heater. <laughs> so I'm here with my my buddy. Oh wait! Oh no, that's a Paul Ryder. Anybody? Yes. Somebody? But Paul, do you have a question? Sure. Okay. All right. So you say you're using Polaroid throughout yeah. your career. Polaroid doesn't exist. You're using Polaroids? And you're still sharing their images? Yeah. So what I've done is, you know, when I, I guess, you know, in the, in the 80s, the film 90s, the film went up to like, you know, 45 or $50 a box. Mm -hmm. And then in the 2000s, it went up to like $75 a box. And then it didn't exist anymore. And now if I can find it on eBay, it's like, I've seen it as high as like $300 a box, which means that that's like, you know, 10 or $20 per sheet. And this is stuff that's 20, you know, it's like old and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't, but I've got some and I put it in the refrigerator and 
I'm trying. This is the last of it. I'm, I'm almost done with the project. But I have somebody else who says, you know, I, they want to commission me to do it digitally. I don't know That's how much perfect. more I can do this. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the Impossible Project? I invested in it. You did. And I got it when it first came out. And I don't know. Do you want the truth? <laughs> do you want? Sure. <laughs> so I can find Polaroid 55 on eBay. And I've got a refrigerator. I got maybe six more boxes. And I was going to go out last year, but couldn't do it. So I'm going out again this year. And I think this might be the last of my Polaroids. <laughs> so you're not a big fan of the instant, uh, the impossible project. <laughs> I tried, man, <laughs> I got, I had like, you know, I had 10 boxes or something in my bag. Fortunately, I had some of that old outdated, obsolete, you know, unrefrigerated Polaroid in my bag that just, that stuff just works, you know? Because yeah. the other, like the instant, whatever, impo that other impossible film <laughs> is impossible, just like it says in the name. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, that guy, I have to, he did an amazing thing. It was just, you know, to resurrect that was yeah. just incredible. I don't know if you guys know what we're talking about, but it's the Polaroid went out of business. There was a fellow and I can't remember his name that basically resurrected like Polaroid film for fine artists. And I mean, the, one of the reasons that Polaroid stayed in business is because in, because of the industry. Industry supported, you know, Kodak and Polaroid and all those films. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, us because we think it's cute. It's just... Yeah, it was in it, it was an, a great industrial tool, but you know, as soon as digital came out, it sort of killed it. Yes, I worked at the place that bragged that they used the largest amount of Polaroid in the world. Where was it? Franklin Mint. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then what happened? Well, they closed up, and then digital came in. It just, yeah. Everything went away. It's all digital. Yeah. Everything. David, you got a question. Well, I see that we have a text question and it says uh, from Marcus, it says, were there any situations with your travels where you felt some of the issues around you could have been solved with an artistic spin? Something you wanted to do, but didn't have the chance or power to change. I'm looking for Marcus on the thing. That's a very, it's a thoughtful question. And were there any situ So you specify on the, in the travels, but so that sort of cuts out a lot where I felt that some of the issues could have been solved. Yeah. Yes, I have to answer that question with a yes because one of the reasons that I was there, I had been invited to some of these places, like you know the place in New Zealand, for example, um, because you know because I was an artist and I was meant to work in the community from the standpoint of being an artist. Polyphony, the name of the project that I started, is still going, which is amazing for an art project to take root like that and for people to continue to find a way to express themselves and relate to the community at large by using the arts I think is something that's just amazing but and of course you know it's it's infrastructure that's behind everything I mean if there was a, a large enough budget you know, a lot of, yeah, there are, there were some failures that I've seen. Uh, there's instances where the community just is not invested in some of the projects that I've done. So, you know, if the, if whenever you do in public art, if the community 
doesn't feel like they need it, then the chances are it's just, it's not going to work. So I've had great failures and I've had great successes. Well, that's wonderful, Professor Graham. Thank you so much. We have reached one o'clock. And so we're going to usher you to your next location. Alex, it's correct that it is a different meeting than this one, correct? So everybody who wants to be in the uh, black meeting uh, needs to uh, leave this meeting and, and sign in again, correct? That's correct. Yeah, you would just you just leave this meeting and you can click on that um, Zoom link that Eric sent out. We also, like Eric mentioned, updated oh, the calendar event. So you can just also hop to that calendar event and click the link there. Um, if you're already signed in, like on your app or anything, it should just kind of fling you right in and you should be fine. But um, in the off chance, you might have to um, sign in your credentials again. Or if you're using a browser, uh, it might ask you for a preferred name again or something like that. Once again, thank you. So thank you. Much. Thanks very thank much. You. We'll see you soon. Listen, if anybody has any questions, just send me an email. Call me. We can talk. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so generous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>